I have a strange story to tell you, and it's a story that we often tell our children, but I don't really think we tell our children the real story of Noah, because Noah is a very odd, odd story. Now, uh, the, the thing about it is that it's set about 800 years before where we've been studying in Luke, uh, which is the time of Jesus. It's about 800 years before that, and uh, it's 781 B.C. Israel was once a very large nation, and, uh, and they had a, a lot of things going for them. They had great leaders, and, uh, and the, the best leader of them all, Solomon, people would come from miles and miles and, and, and months' journey just to sit in His presence and hear what He had to say. And He would talk about His God and the wisdom that His God has brought Him. And uh, but at this point, it, they're a divided nation. In fact, Solomon's, uh, two of Solomon's sons fought for control of Israel, and after three days, split the place in two. And it's not that they went the, from this large place to a place that's split in half. It actually is much worse than that. If you see this, this is our map, and uh, Israel only had three kings as, as a whole nation. The, uh, uh, the first is Solomon, uh, the first one is Saul, and he had the little area uh, that's, uh, I don't know what color that is, uh, the uh, fleshy color, so <laughs> that one right there. That is, uh, th th those are the 12 tribes. Now, uh, David comes in after him, and he gives Israel real borders and, and a real nation, and, uh, and, and it grows by a little bit more, but all of the green... That's all Solomon. People wanted to be with Solomon, and so the borders expanded greatly. Solomon's kids, after two days, three days, this is what's left. It's a very small thing, and it's two nations there. And the thing about it is that when you go from, from a, a, a large nation to a small divided nation, they go from being large and in charge, everybody wants to be their friend, they're important, and they're very proud of it, they go to a much smaller nation where they're not important, but they're still very proud of it <laughs> because that's kind of the way they are. Uh, and there are bigger countries that want your stuff, <laughs> and so that's going to be a problem. Now, uh, this is where we're going to start in Jonah chapter 1, starting with verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amadi, go to the great city of Nineveh. And preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Wickedness. That's a great word. It should be used more in the Bible. So, now, when, when we're talking about this divided nation, that is this box right here, okay? The big old green, that is the nation of Assyria. <laughs> and they, want, they think they're in charge of all of that. Nineveh is the capital, and that's right over here. So, um, so it's Jonah uh, that's being asked to go on a three- or four-month journey up here and over here, go to Nineveh, and tell them about Jesus. That sounds really easy, right? Okay, well, Jesus isn't around yet, but that's where he's going. They tell him about God. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. Now, you might have run from the Lord before. Um, I, I've certainly uh, kind of sidestepped him a little bit. I got to tell you this, um, from this story I have learned, never take a boat. And this is why. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh, and there's a reason. Nineveh is the enemy. Not just like we don't like those people, not just like, uh, like uh, the, the rivalries between NFL teams. This is big. In fact, Assyria came in and said, hey, you guys, you look like you have a really nice country here. It'd, it'd be a shame if something happened to it, right? So the, the way it's going to work is you're going to do what we tell you to do, and your king's going to work for us, and every year we're going to take some tax from you a lot. Uh, that's called a, it's called a tribute to their king, and, uh, and it, it, it makes them a vassal state which means they're not in charge anymore, but you get to keep being a nation and we won't break your stuff. Assyria at that time was in charge 
And that's a horrible place to be. They don't want somebody else to be in charge. So, Jonah is being asked to go and tell all of those stinking rotten Gentiles over there that they're wicked and that God wants them to do something else. Jonah wants no part of that. He does not want a heaven where Ninevites are invited, right? He doesn't want to go and share his God with those kind of people. And he's running. Well, he's boating. So, why is he going to Tarshish? Well, uh, it's, it's about as far as he could go. He, he didn't know a place that was farther than that. So, that's, uh, it's uh, taking a boat in the Mediterranean from Israel over to, uh, to, uh, to Spain. And that's where he's going. It is the farthest. It's the end of the earth. So, because uh, if he went... If he went west, that, or if he went east, that would be uh, towards Nineveh. So he's going west as far as he could possibly think. So that's where he's going. The Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm rose up that the ship threatened to break up. So they were going to have that talk. I don't really want to date anymore. We're going to, I think we're going to break up. So the ship is going to break up with them. The sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots and find out who is responsible for this calamity. You know, uh, sometimes you just got to think, maybe it's just a storm, but it's not, and the sailors knew it. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. This is like gambling to find out who wins, except the question is, who's the loser that caused this, right? Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? All good questions, and he answers them. He answered, I am a Hebrew, I, and I worship Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. He made all of it. They, uh, this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? Right? You ever heard that question? <laughs> Pretty scary stuff. What did Jonah do? Well, he, he ran because he wasn't interested in following God's directions. And it's a really simple thing. The ship will not break up with you if you throw me overboard. Now, I'm just thinking, if you knew that was the solution and you're asking somebody, why don't you just jump? Right? Well, I, I, don't think I, would, I don't think I would jump either. I'd be going, you're you're going to have to push, right? <laughs> this, this is not really going willingly, okay? That's a big old ocean out there. As soon as that happened, the winds and the waves died down, the storm went away immediately, and a giant fish or whale or whatever it was came up and swallowed him all. Not the end of the story. He's in there for three days and three nights. What would you do at this point? Pray. That's what Jonah does. You know why? Because there's nothing else to do, right? This is a good time. And he prays all of chapter 2. And as he prays all of chapter 2, he says, I'm I'm totally, I'm in for this, fine. You want to get my attention? You've got it. I'll go tell all of those wicked, nasty people over there about you, but I'm not happy about it. And he says, what I have vowed, I will make good. (laughs) He says, if you'll get me out of this, I promise, right? I will say salvation comes from the Lord, because that's the way prophets speak. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited, which is another word that should be used more in Scripture, vomited Jonah onto dry land, which is a good trick because I would think he wouldn't, it wouldn't be dry anymore. He, right, I mean, so Jonah gives it all he's got, right? It, and it's still, I don't know where he gets vomited up, but he, it's at least a three-month journey over there. So it's not like the fish swam onto dry land and crawled over there and vomited him out. So he's got a ways to go wherever he is. And, uh, and he walks the whole city. He spends three days doing it. And the whole time, he's telling them about the love of Jesus. 
Actually, what he's doing is he's walking going, you Ninevites are wicked, evil people, and my God is going to bring destruction on you. And you, and you, and you. Because you're all mean, nasty people. Took him a while to get there. It built up in him. He did that for three days. Horrible, ugly, mean, cruel people. All gonna burn. The message reaches the king. If I were the king, I'd be going, go, go get that guy, <laughs> right? He doesn't. You know what he says? He says this, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that he, we will not so that we will not punish, perish. I know that word. <laughs> turn or burn, I'd like to turn, right? That's what he said. When God saw this, uh, what, they had, what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Isn't that a beautiful story? I love that. Everyone wins in the end because the Ninevites that are in charge of all of Israel, they turn to God, they turn their hearts over, they receive the mercy and love from God that they did not have before. They turned from their wicked ways, they gave up their violence, they became lovers of God. And everyone was happy except Jonah. <laughs> Jonah was significantly not happy. He goes, I knew if I came here that you would forgive them and not destroy them. That's why I didn't want to come. <laughs> really? Yeah. God said, you're not in charge. <laughs> in fact, he's, he's moping and he's, he's, just, he's being ridiculous and God causes his plant to grow up and give him shade. And he goes, ah, oh, that's nice. And then God causes the sun to dry it out, and it blows away. And he, God says, I'm in charge of all of it, so stop being ridiculous. But even at the end, he's still ridiculous. It's a crazy, horrible story. I don't know why we tell this to our children. So, we're talking uh, about the, uh, a story that we're going to find in the gospel according to Luke. We're in chapter 11. Uh, we've been in chapter uh, 11 for a couple of weeks now. We've been in Luke since last November. So we're going to be here for a while. But we take it one story at a time. We talk about the stories that God has brought to us through this. And, and the way we do it is we talk about the, the background and the history so that we understand these words and be able to walk through them as a, as a kind of a three-dimensional story instead of just words on a page. Now, the, the difference between this gospel and the other three is that Luke is not Jewish. He doesn't have a Hebrew background, and so when he talks to us, he talks to us from a non-Hebrew background. He's Greek, he's come down, he's done the research, and now he is telling us his story, but he's telling us a story that he has gone down, he has heard, he has taken eyewitness accounts, and he writes these things down, and sometimes he includes things that are different. Now, the reason why... He includes some things. Well, they talk about outsiders. And today, Jesus is going to be talking about outsiders. So, now, during this time period, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus is walking around, they are occupied by Rome. They've actually been occupied by different countries, but it, they've been occupied for 600 years at this point. And during this time that they have been occupied, God has said, if you will follow my law, I will bring for you a hero, and that hero is going to free you from your oppression. And, he, and you will know who he is, because I, and, and, he, and, uh, and throughout all of the prophecy, God, through the prophets, has described how you're going to know that he is the Messiah, the chosen one of God, the hero for Israel that will restore them and will make Israel once again a, a blessing for the world. And 
Jesus is that one that they have been waiting for. He is the anointed one. So they've been talking about it for 700 years, but here he is, healing the sick and raising the dead, casting out demons. He is a, he is a gifted teacher, and people come from all over to hear what he has to say. And the crowds are huge. And all that he needs to do, he's fulfilled everything but one. And that one thing that he hasn't done yet is walk into Jerusalem, kick out Rome, and sit on David's throne as king. And that's where they're going. That's where they want to be. Now, Jesus has gone from, from Galilee into Judea, and, uh, and cause in his own home stomping grounds, he became very famous, and everywhere he went, the crowds were huge. Well, now he's come into Judea, which is, uh, which is just south of there, and as he comes into Judea, goes from Galilee into Judea, where Jerusalem is, it's, he's heading to Jerusalem. People think he's going there to become king. He's not. He's going to give his life for the salvation of the entire world, which is much bigger than being king, right? He's going there, and as he goes, he's got to introduce all these people to, to who he is and to his message. Now, one of the things that he does while he is there, he teaches us to pray, and I want to, uh, and that's in the beginning of chapter 11, and we've been praying this while we've been in chapter 11. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now, okay? You can read it off the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's a beautiful prayer, but the question is, do we really remember what it means? Now, and we've been going through this, if you've been with us, uh, you'll know that when we say, hallowed be your name, it's may your name, even your name be holy because the people that follow you are holy and when people see you, they'll know that you're different, that you will bring so much honor to God through you following Him that even His name will be holy. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing, right? Now, it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who does His work here on earth? You and me. If you are a follower of Jesus and you prayed that prayer, which you just did, I tricked you, what it says is that you have said to God, I will work here on earth with the same fervor and I'll do what you want me to do with the same passion I will when I get to heaven and see you face to face. I will do that here. It also says that I will trust you for what I need even my next meal. I'm not going to try to get in front of you. I'm not going to try to make you do things that, that you know, I don't, I trust that I'm going to eat because I'm doing what you have asked me to do. I will trust you for my next meal. I will forgive others the way that I want you to forgive me, right? Which is, which is the worst news in the whole bit. So, I will learn to forgive, and then once I'm doing everything that God has told me to do and trusting in Him for even my next meal and my next tank of gas, I will then pray for God's protection over my life, which is completely opposite of the way we usually pray, right? God, can you please get me out of this? I'm, I'm, much, I'm much better at Jonah's prayer, right? fine, you've got my attention, I'll do what you want me to do now, all right? But Jesus taught us to pray a different prayer. And you know what? He's asking a lot, right? He asks a whole bunch of you and He asks a whole bunch of me, and I'm not sure I have it in me to do all the things that He has asked me to do. But I got to tell you this, rabbis ask a lot. Now, they teach the 613 laws of Moses found within the first five books of the Bible, that's called the Law of Moses, all of those, that's what the rabbis teach, and they teach us how to live according to His law. The great thing about 613 laws is that it's nearly impossible to live this way. 
But the best news is that when you do, then you're done. You check the box. I did that. And then you don't have to revisit it again, right? It's, you, you get to the end of it. You know, it's like Jesus uh, gets asked by his disciples, how, how, many, how many times should I forgive? I think we should forgive as many as seven times, right? And he thinks that sounds pretty good, right? Seven, seven, that's generous, right? High fives. Jesus says, no, you're never going to be done forgiving. Forgive 70 times seven. He says, you have to keep giving and keep forgiving. And that's what this scripture tells us. You're not going to get to the end and then get to the end and then say, I've done that. Now I get to move on. Jesus says, this is your new way of life. This is all of you. You're going to do all of this. But you don't do it by yourself. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have God's Spirit in you. And God's Spirit is moving in you to change you from the inside out so that this is how you respond, a way that honors Him. So, Jesus has these new challenges ahead of Him. And now, as He goes into Judea, people start asking Him, because the closer you get to Jerusalem, the, the less people want to be a part of a rebellion, because that's their own stuff, right? It's easier if you, if you live way up in Galilee, you go, hey, let's go to Jerusalem and break all their favorite stuff, right? If you're in Jerusalem, they go, hey, that's my stuff, right? So the closer they get, the more they're not really interested in this whole Messiah thing. And so they say, if you're really the Messiah, then maybe you should, you should prove it to me again. Now, they're asking for a sign, and as they ask for a sign, that, that makes sense, because prophets would come and go, this is the Word of God, this is what God has told me to tell you, and this is the sign that will accompany it. So it, this, is, this is normal, this is natural for them to say that, but Jesus is tired of proving it to people, right? So He's done, and we'll see this in His Scripture today. As the crowds increased down there in, Jeru- in, in Judea, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. What's that word again? Glad it's being used more, right? Wicked generation. I asked for a sign, but none was given it except the sign of Jonah. Oh, I wonder what it is. It's, a, it's like a bat sign, I don't know, like a giant whale in the sky. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man, that's how he talks about himself in third person, which is a little odd, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation, which is 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Jesus, that he's not talking about us. <laughs> the sign of Jonah. Jonah is in the belly of this fish for three days, and he's moving from the condemned, right, because they need to throw him overboard, get rid of you, goes from the condemned to the Savior for the Ninevites. He is calling the wicked people of Nineveh to repentance, and his hard, harsh words cause their hearts to be soft, and the message of destruction that he brought becomes a message of hope, because God hears their cry. I love this part, right? That's the sign of Jonah. That's a pretty good sign. And then, the queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth, which which is Ethiopia. It's as far south as they could think, right? (laughs) The ends of the earth, all the way in Ethiopia, Uh, to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. He says, Solomon was a pretty good attraction. I'm the son of God. You should be listening to what I say, right? So, the queen of Ethiopia came up to hear Solomon. She was one of the ones who wanted to hear what, what this great Solomon, how wise he was. So, he, she, he come, she comes up to see Solomon. And, he, uh, and she brings with her gifts of spices. Now, it's not just a little bit, and it's not just like a whole camel load. It's a whole train of camels that she brings with her and comes up. And she says, Solomon, I know that you are wise, and I want to be your friend. And everybody wanted to be Solomon's friend. And then she quizzed him. 
because she wanted real answers. And she got real answers that came from God and the wisdom that God has given Solomon. And she took that back with her. So, we have the, the queen and we have the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here, himself, right? So they listened to Jonah, you should be listening to me, and you will be condemned by them because they'll be at, at your judgment. That's pretty harsh, right? Those Gentiles that Jonah didn't want to share heaven with, they're going to be there. The, the queen of the south, the queen of Ethiopia, she's going to be there. And she's going to be sitting there looking down at you, arms crossed and just shaking her head. What were you thinking? Right? It's like they're going to be there saying the Son of God, the Messiah was there and you knew who He was and you didn't listen? You guys are nuts. That's going to be a pretty good kick in the teeth, right? When you get there, because all of these Jews thought themselves to be superior because they're God's chosen people, God likes us best, right? And yet there's going to be all of these Gentiles there to bring their condemnation on them. And then I think, okay, let's apply this to us and our generation, the people that we go to church with. What I mean by that is the nine o'clock service. For those people, they're really good at going, okay, but maybe I should have another sign. Okay, but I'm not quite ready for that yet. Okay, stop pushing me, right? Those people are whiners. And when Jesus says this to the religious people of the day, He's saying that to us today. There's something greater here. You need to be paying attention. For I'm calling you to do something very hard. There's a reason for that. The sign of Jesus. In case you missed it, He is going to a Roman cross. And He is calling the wicked of Israel to repentance. And His hard words will make soft hearts. And He will be killed and ex executed and dead for three days. And when he arrives, he comes back to life in all his glory. And God pushes the tomb open and he comes out. And the message of condemnation becomes the message of hope for their generation and ours. He will bring his salvation. He goes from the condemned when He takes all of our sins on Him, and when He dies, He dies for us so that He can offer us salvation through forgiveness of sin. This is important for us to understand. He is going there willingly, right? He is committed to this cross. He's already been telling His disciples, it's already listed twice already in Luke, that He has told them in no uncertain terms, I am going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die on a Roman cross at the hands of the religious people of the Jews there. They're going to kill me, but I'm going to come back to life in three days. And they go, huh, I wonder what that means, right? I don't have a clue. I don't know how this is going to work. And Jesus says again, I'll be gone for three days, but I'm coming back. And you need to know, that this is important. I am fully committed to doing what God has called me to do. What about you? Right? He's asking a lot of us. He's asking us to live the same commitment that He has. He is living His life to pay the penalty for all of our sin. It's our job to live our life. 
for Him. My question to you is, are you living a life that when people see you, that people will know how honorable and how holy even God's name is because they see you? Is that how you live? Well, not exactly. We need to be all in. And we need to sacrifice those things in us that aren't like Him. And we need to give them to Him so that, so that He can change us from the inside out. This is hard. And what He's asking is a lot. But He has sent His Spirit to you. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have Him inside of you. If you will let Him, He will continue to transform you into who He is so that every part of you responds like He responds. I desire that in my life. Is that where you want to be? Because this is a scary message. I look at me and there was... There was a day like last fall when I didn't respond the way Jesus would have. It's a joke. Right? Are you all in? You may say, I don't even know if I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, if you're not and you would like to be, you can say this. I must say a prayer out loud. If you say it in your heart, God will change you from the inside out. He makes you a, a, a part of His kingdom. You are a follower of His because He has found you, called you, and brought you into His kingdom. And we say a prayer that says, you are my Savior because I can't save myself by doing good things. That's not how you get to heaven. We say, you're my King and I want to learn to do everything you tell me to. And I want to be your friend and I want you to share with me the way that you see my world. If that's who you want to be, then I want you to say this prayer in your heart as I say it out loud here in a moment. Will you bow your head and close your eyes just making an altar where you're at? And if you are a follower of Jesus today, I want to ask you, are you all in? Will you ask Jesus to take the things that aren't like you, the things that aren't like God, get rid of them in your life so that you will reflect God in every way? If you are uncertain about where you'll spend eternity, say this prayer in your heart as I say it out loud, and God will meet you right where you're at and make you part of His kingdom today. Father God, be my Savior, because I can't save myself. Be my King. May I learn to say yes always. Be my friend. Show me my world through your eyes. I thank you for your gift of eternal life that starts for me today. In Jesus' name, amen.